This short video describes a new research project on the importance of genetic variation in tundra plants in response to a warming climate. Could adaptive genetic variation among populations, which has been found in many tundra plant species, be an asset in the face of climate warming? Or could it be a liability that limits the population's ability to respond? This project aims to find out by revisiting two studies set up 30 years ago in Alaska. This short video provides a brief overview of a few of our field sites and some of the projects carried out by undergraduate and graduate students from four universities. West Virginia University, Wilkes University, Stetson, and Glenville State College. One of the two studies involved a reciprocal transplant between two genetically distinct, locally adapted populations of a single species called mountain avens, with the botanical name Dryas octopetala. Dryas is a dominant dwarf shrub species of fell fields, windblown, exposed plant communities of high alpine and northern arctic tundra. My research from 30 years ago showed large adaptive differences between populations found only 10 to 100 meters apart at an Eagle Creek snowbank. In summer 2010, Mylon Vavrick, a faculty member from Glenville State, and his student, Melissa Shockey, were helping me repeat the transplant studies of 1979 to see if the warming climate had changed the pattern of local adaptation. Here is one of our transplants. But most of our time in 2010 was spent revisiting a similar study along a latitudinal gradient from Eagle Creek, Alaska to Prudhoe Bay on the northern fringe of the North Slope. Our subject for these gardens was Eriophorum vaginatum, or cotton grass. Like Dryas, Eriophorum varies greatly in size from southern to northern populations. Here at No Name Creek, cotton grass clumps, or tussocks, are sometimes knee-high and walking among them is difficult. A fire burned this site several years ago, making it difficult to find some of our transplants. Our original question with this experiment was, can the smaller, slower growing northern tussocks survive among these giants? But now we want to know, has climate warming made the environment farther north more favorable for these southern tussocks? The best way to measure response to transplant gardens is to study survival and reproduction, both components of fitness. But in tussock tundra, a more subtle indicator of performance can be measured to pick out smaller changes. That is, growth of the tiller population comprising each individual tussock. To study tiller populations, we devised markers from pre-numbered pet tags, simply adding coated wire to each tag. Here, Melissa Shockey shows the tagging procedure on an actual transplanted tussock. Senior collaborators, Mylon Vavrick and Cindy Bennington, used their experiences studying tundra graminoids in the late 80s and early 90s in tagging hundreds of cotton grass transplant tillers. Our undergraduate interns were asked to design their own research projects. Caitlin Peterson from Stetson University in Florida was curious about the response to reciprocal transplanting of stomates in cotton grass. She explains her project here. So I find a likely looking tiller. Um, yeah. I'm trying to get ones, the, the widest ones that, on, that are on the tussock, yeah. because those generally make the best peels. Okay. Um, and then I find the longest flat side. All right. So that's one of the two sides that has stomata on it. I'm just going to hold it like that. I'm grab the nail polish. Okay. Wipe it on there as evenly as possible. And then let it go free. And pull out a slide, label it with the site. Okay. And the tussock ID. So, MS. And dash cold six. foot six. Correct. And this is the second kind of tape. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's just clear scotch tape. And so, use my marker to find where the strip of nail polish is. Okay. And then I just stick the tape right over it. All right. And peel it off like that. Cool. 
And then stick that straight on the slide. Huh. And then later, what will you do with that? And then I will take it home with me and look at all of these slides under the microscope mm -hmm. and um, choose random areas on the sample. Um, and then I will count the number of stomata in each field and use that to calculate the density of stomata on okay. every leaf. Take an average and try to determine if there are any differences between the ecotypes. Two graduate students from WVU participated in the project. Here Zach Fowler is making chlorophyll fluorescence measures on cotton grass. Fluorescence measures the stress effects on a plant's photosynthetic apparatus. Copi and Ned Fetcher worked extensively with our other graduate student, Sarah Souther, who measured photosynthetic rates using infrared gas analyzers. Photosynthesis is a key physiological process, and Ned is optimistic that despite a high level of variation, there will be some interesting findings. This is one of those <laughs> good finding things when there's nothing there. <laughs> In summer 2011, we will be recruiting three more undergraduates and two graduate students to join our expedition. During the expedition, students not only participate in this important research, but also learn from some of the world's leading ecologists, like Gus Shaver, talking to us here about the fascinating plant and animal species of the far north, and the overall importance of tundra ecosystems to the global carbon cycle. Kelly Cummings summed up her experience this way. It's, it's a lot more tedious than I thought it was going to be, but yeah. it was worth it, yeah. definitely. And I would love to do more research.